Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week I sit down with a different industry thought leader and we discuss the latest cybersecurity trends, how those trends are affecting the work of InfoSec professionals, while offering tips for those trying to break in or move up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. When today's guest contacted me with this personal biographical fragment, I don't think I need to explain why I absolutely had to have him on the show, so I'll quote it in full. I went into hacking when I was six years old, compelled by the world of possibilities that came into our rural home with my first computer. It took the police at my door for me to realize that my skills could actually be a force for good. They gave me a second chance and I took it with both hands coding. At age nine, I started my own company, Penetra Penetrating Communications Network for risk management purposes, using my deep knowledge of security breaches and unknown threats. From my parents' home, I hacked into banks, insurance companies, ISPs, defense organizations, and numerous businesses, all with the sole purpose of exposing vulnerabilities and helping their cybersecurity teams excel. At age 10, I began attending Israel's highest tech institution, Technion, and continued dabbling with hacking into a variety of organizations. So I think that any of us in the cybersecurity world are going to want to hear about the security journey of a person with such a rarefied background. Uh, however, since most of us aren't security prodigies, I know I'm not, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, and talking with our guest, Nir Geist, of the company Niotron, about some of the techniques or strategies that can help us work in our, our job and career as if we actually were a cybersecurity genius from childhood. Nir Geist, founder and CTO of Niotron, is a recognized information security expert and ethical hacker. He started programming at age six and began his studies at the Israeli Technion University at age 10. Nir has worked with some of the largest Israeli organizations, such as the Israeli police, the Israeli parliament, and Microsoft's Israeli headquarters. He also wrote cybersecurity curriculum for the Israel Ministry of Education. Nir holds patents for the creation of a programming language called Behavior Pattern Mapping, or BPM, that enables monitoring of the integrity of the operation system behavior to deliver threat agnostic protection. Nir, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. That was, uh, <laughs> that was indeed long. I, uh... <laughs> Comprehensive info here. So uh, uh, I guess there's nowhere to start but, you know, the very beginning. So you said you got into hacking when you were six years old, uh, compelled by the world of possibilities that came into your rural home with their first computer. So tell me about the sort of before, for, before after of getting your first computer. Like what changed? What did the world look, how did it look different after you got it? Well, the world was uh, was different uh, somehow, but uh, to be to be very practical, I think after I um, you know after I drew the uh, the first smiley in uh, MS Paint, uh, you know I, right. I, I I went straight to try and do stuff myself. I don't think I was ever a gamer or into into games, so um, I think I was very um, you know an explorer if you uh, if you want uh, in my nature. So. Uh, I was what after what, what happened after is I went straight into uh, living in front of my computer. I think that my parents would say that uh, they saw me less and less, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I was always there in front of the computer. That uh, in, in, in my entire social life, uh, for the good and the bad of it, uh, was was there. Right. Well, what what year would this have been? Um, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Well, what year was this? What, when did you get this computer? Oh. What? Uh, I think it was uh, the early 90s. Early uh, 90s, okay. Uh, for the nerds among us, which, what, what kind of computer was it? 486. Okay. <laughs> nice. Uh, so um, you, you mentioned the MS Paint, and then you immediately sort of went went into the guts of the machine. But what, what were some of the first things you did with your new machine? Like, you know, you said you, you, you sort of lost all social contact and, 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 you know, parents and so forth. But what were you what were you doing sort of immediately, like those first couple of weeks? What were you sort of digging around in? So I remember I, uh, I, I first really played with the very basic stuff of a computer. I had no you know, previous uh, skill set, and mm -hmm. my parents had really no knowledge of, of the area. Um, so I, it was just me and the computer. So I played with um, everything that was on it. I think I wasn't even aware I can download games. I, I had internet uh, connectivity, and I... I, I asked my dad, why do we need it? So at first we even just disconnected from the internet because I had no idea what to yeah. do with that. Um, and I think I started playing with whatever was already on the disk, which was the operating system. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember the boot high and I file. I started to change stuff and see what, what, what's going on. Uh, and sooner or later I, I, I saw, I think it was IRC on uh, a computer of a friend. Hmm. And uh, uh, that was really the, um, the 
the door for me to to everything. Uh, once I connected to um, to the some IRC network, uh, I think it was Fnet. Eventually, uh, that's where I really realized uh, I could do a lot of stuff. I got to meet a lot of other people like me, and right. uh, yeah, that was uh, the beginning of everything. So, were you you pretty open about sort of? talking to people on IRC and asking questions and, and collaborating in that way? Yeah, back then it was it was really all about building stuff together. And right. It, it was very, very professional uh, back then. And um, yeah, that was, uh, uh, that's where I got to know some people that I know even today, some mm-hmm. of them I really work with uh, since the very, very uh, early days. And uh, that's, um, that's where I really got m- massive uh, of the, the knowledge and and everything did you were, were you pretty open about the fact that you were six years old or seven years old and you know how did people react to that <laughs> well that's the that's really what's so powerful and beautiful about about uh, those days uh, no mm-hmm. one really cared about about anything uh they yeah. were it was all about what you know uh, what they can learn from you what you can learn from them right and that's why I, I still love this uh, <laughs> this protocol and in MIRC specifically uh, um, really forever. Yeah. So I, I mean, at that point, the, there was a high enough bar to sort of get on the internet at that point that I feel like anyone who was on the internet was like, sure, why not a seven year old? <laughs> you know, like we're all we're all here together in this sort of special place, so we might as well all share our information. Well, they didn't necessarily knew what age is you know we right. Didn't, you didn't know about it. We we sometimes we didn't even know where you're yeah. from. And, yeah, you uh, use usernames and right. It was all anonymous. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you mentioned the, the the police were at your door around this time. So you know, apart from just the sheer fear of the situation and the desire not to be punished, like walk me through the, your mindset of going from hacking everything in sight to realizing either through change of mind or fear of punishment that there was a choice between being a force for good and a force for evil in the computer world. <laughs> Well, there wasn't a point where I uh, I thought, oh, I have this knowledge, then should I be good or bad? I don't think there was never such an intersection. I, um, from my point of view, I was always good. Uh, right. Everything was was. You were just learning. Uh, yeah, exactly. And really, I don't think I ever done any any bad thing besides mm-hmm. get to where I should should have been for the first place. And okay. It's, um, what maybe not everyone understands is that when you are in your bedroom and you have this computer and keyboard and everything, um, and everything is virtual, you don't really understand that you're doing something illegal or anything like that until... Or that you're even doing something in the real world. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and I think um, I, that situation really helped me to understand that first I really know something that not, not everybody knows. And you can actually do something with that. So the choice between good and bad then was very, very natural for me. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean that that's interesting because it, you know it, you're basically uh, you know you're not doing it with a, a particular intent. You're just doing it to see if you can do the next thing. So it's like, oh, exactly. I got into this. Can I get into this? Can I get into this? It's it's a game and, and it's challenging and uh, and you sometimes play with your friends even. So um, uh, I I think at that point. Really, uh, that was a point that's li- that was life changing for me. But um, but again, there was never a choice between. Good and bad. It was always very clear. So when you were when when you were given the stern talking to you, you took the you took the advice to heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so clearly, based on your next business plan, you were doing penetration testing at age nine. Uh, you were obviously on the white side of the white hats. But again, it just sounds like you were just excited about sort of doing this thing and learning this thing. So how did that business go at the outset? Were companies leery of letting a nine-year-old, albeit a prodigy, handle this process? Yeah, I think that um, um, back then, again, the age wasn't a problem, especially with how I started. Obviously, the, uh, my first customer was the, was, was the one that at first called the police, but pretty okay. quickly, uh, pretty quickly we settled this down and um, I helped them. It was a big ISP. In Israel, I, I helped them fix the problems, and and from there, you know, it, it, it was about uh, um, their contacts, and and they 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 made the introduction. And Israel is a very uh, very small country, so mm-hmm. um, uh, people can check references pretty pretty easy easily. So um, yeah, the, the age was it was never never a problem. Okay, um, and what did you learn from working with large corporations like this at that age? 
I think I learned a lot. I think that's 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 a great question because um, for many people, you know, looking at um, uh, banks and, and, and ISPs and uh, some defense organizations even, you tend to think that uh, those organizations know everything and they have everything and, um, and, and it looks so big to you. Right. Uh, and I think what I learned was very important. Um, I realized that uh, although they are very big and very experienced, uh, I do have some, some, some room in the game. I do have something to contribute. Um, right. It helped me a lot to shape, shape myself as a, as a professional. Um, and that's what I tell people all the time. I mean, uh, you probably know at least 30, 40 percent than, than what you think you know. Okay. And, and, and you do have a lot to do out there, and these organizations do need you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's, that's also very interesting. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, um, I, I feel like you probably were able to sort of shake off any sort of like, oh, I don't know if I should be here or not, just by the sheer fact of, you know, you have all this knowledge and you like doing it. So it's just, why wouldn't I do it for these people? Exactly. exactly. How, how many clients did you have around that time? Uh, not, not too many, but, but enough to a couple. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Drive, drive a living at a very early age. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I have, uh, I'd say about a dozen actually wow. in the financial, in, in the financial world, uh, especially in Israel, organizations are actually regulated to, to hire someone third party to do a, to do a pandas once a year. And what really sets me apart is that, uh, I wasn't there just to do a vulnerability assessment. I was, I was hired to actually prove them. I can make a real damage right. uh, by, by hacking, you know, ATMs and all that stuff. So it was, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is this is the mid 90s right so i mean th- this wasn't like penetration testing wasn't that much of a thing yet you were really kind of at the sort of front edge of people understanding that this needed oh, yeah. to happen right uh, blue, blue ocean not a lot of competition <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> um so by age 10 you were studying at at uh, technion uh, israel's highest tech uh, tech institution uh could you tell me a little bit about that experience i mean you had a lot of self-taught experience but were you able to still learn new things in an educational context here yeah, ab- absolutely. Uh, although, um, again, uh, I do believe in uh, being a self-taught. I think right. uh, some of the best professionals I've hired not, did not necessarily have uh, um, uh, academic degree. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I really don't think uh, uh, it's, a, it's a mandatory thing necessarily, but uh, definitely go and, and study in, uh, in, in a different institution gives you some different perspective, uh, not necessarily in the university, but in ev- everywhere you go, you know, st- study something differently would, would help you see things uh, in, in a different way. So th- m- much of, uh, lots of the theory, I think I got, I got there. And also just the, the difference of learning process and how you sort of acquire information, things like that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so before we talk about careers in the state of the industry and so forth, um, you know, I still want to kind of probe a little more into the notion of being a child prodigy or a genius or something at the, like this at an early age. Uh, you know, apart from just knowing that you're an incredibly intelligent person and a quick learner, can you tell me a bit about your learning methods? Like when you were six and you got the computer, what's what's the first thing you did with it? And then the second and the third and so forth. Like, can, I mean, is that I mean, I know you're very close to that, but can you kind of like break apart like how you learn a new thing? Yeah, first of all, I, I, I'm not a big fan of, of the terminology, you know, about genius and all that stuff. I think right. that, you know, uh, I, I tend to uh, look at myself as a person with a lot of uh, uh, ambition. Uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, I, I just, as I told you, I, I look at things that I don't think, oh, I can never do that. Or um, uh, I think that everything you see around you, some, someone built it so you could definitely do something if you just wanted. Um, and in terms of method, methods of, of learning, um, I, it's not that I have a very special formula, uh, but I can tell you that um, if, if something is of a high interest to me, if I, if I really find it interesting um, and, I, and I can understand what's the use of it, uh, it helps me a lot. Uh, if, uh, if I don't find any interest in something, I'll be pretty sucked in, <laughs> in learning right. that. Uh, and, uh, and I have a proof for that as well, but, um, but I really think when I understand why I need something and what will be the use of it, uh, it, it helps me a lot to, to study. So don't go and study assembly or, or any specific programming language without trying to build something. Uh, mm-hmm. that was what, uh, that's what was really, uh, uh, I, I feel I really lacked that in, in the, uh, in the academy. Um, because to build, to, to really learn stuff theoretically without understanding the use of it, 
it's uh, it's really hard. Yeah. So b- build a thing before you learn to take it apart. Yeah, I definitely started start, started this way. I mean, when I got my computer, I wanted to to do these things. I, I saw something, I tried to change it, I tried to play with it. I really know uh, what's gonna what's the purpose of it. So, um, how has the business of of pen testing changed since you started, whether procedurally or, or technique wise? Uh, Pandas specifically, um, yeah. like cybersecurity in general, I think many things changed. I think that uh, this industry is, um, I look at it as a kind of a gold rush, you know, it's mm-hmm. uh, the hype is just too big. I think there is um, uh, too many that are kind of sheeple. Uh, they, they go after it because it's lucrative, because it seems to be lucrative and not because they really love it and not because right. they really want to do it. And, and I think when, when you do things from, from that, uh, from that place, uh, it, it really, it's really bad for the industry as a whole. Hmm. Uh, uh, when I started and, and I started this company, Neutron, and we started to build what we built, um, it was really just about uh, let's, let's detect and prevent things without signatures. Mm-hmm. Uh, it sounds so basic today because there are hundreds, maybe thousands of companies who says that, but at the end of the day, um, many, many basic problems are not really solved. Without, with, with all these companies and all these investments. So there is, there is a problem still. Hmm. Um, so for those of us who are coming to cybersecurity, even those of us that, you know, for whom this practice doesn't come naturally, might have the ambition, but not necessarily, you know, the in- intuition of it. What are some learning tips or techniques you can impart that have helped you to sort of achieve a level of mastery? Um, so uh, I think the, really the, the biggest advice I can give people is be focused and don't be a sheeple. Okay. So, uh, uh, really focus on understand what you're really good at, what you really like, which probably uh, the higher the chance you're going to be good at it if you really like it. Um, and don't just go do things because they seem to be lucrative. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't, don't be a sheeple. Right. Um, so as someone who's the founder of his own company and no doubt hires his own staff, I, I would imagine, uh, what are some of the characteristics and skill sets that you're looking for in a, in a candidate to work for Neutron? So uh, we do have a pretty, uh, pretty cool testing uh, process. And uh, mm-hmm. it's a test where we really try to, to distinguish between your skills and your way of thinking. Okay. Um, and... Uh, that, that's really what we're looking at with, with people. Of course, we do need some skill set, but uh, we really want to understand when you solve something, not just what was your skills, but really how you got to that solution. And what, what did you think? Even if the solution was, was wrong, and, and, and really it's not a cliche. I mean, if, uh, if, if your way of thinking was, was, uh, was good, was unique, uh, we, we would hire you. Um, I don't think we are big fans of, uh, you know, an academic degree or uh, this certification or that certification because, as I said, it's not about your skills. It's about, uh, it's about your way of thinking and about your passion. Uh, I think what I, I want to see in people is, uh, uh, you know, someone who really loves to do what, what he does. Uh, he's really good at it because, uh, because that's his passion. Uh, so that's what I can say. Uh, do you have any uh, theories or suggestions or even any thoughts in general on uh, the so-called cybersecurity skills gap in which there are more high-level security job roles to be filled than there are professionals to fill them? Is it, I've, we had a, a previous guest uh, from Israel who said that uh, she thought there might be a little less of that over there because of the sort of military conscription. There was a lot of opportunities to learn cybersecurity and that there was there were a lot more sort of experts in the field. But do you have any? Is the is the skills gap a thing in in Israel? Is it different from the U.S. Or? So in, in Israel, there are actually uh, uh, there's there's a lot of talent. Mm-hmm. Um, I I think in, in in Israel there might be uh, even more talent than than um, um, than, than positions. But uh, I I think that in in general in the cybersecurity industry we are clearly. It's, it's clearly an inflection point. Uh, the, the industry is clearly going through some, some change. So if, if I try to predict, if I try to look, to look ahead, um, I'd say that this situation, even if there are more positions than, than, uh, um, than the talents out there, it's very temporary. Okay. Um, so I wouldn't count on it. I wouldn't start a career based, based on the current situation. Mm-hmm. 
Interesting. Uh, how would you, if, if as a pen tester, you know, trying to get into the industry, how would you suggest making yourself stand out when everyone and their uncle is trying to be a professional pen tester? What, what kind of experiences or, you know, what, what would sort of make your resume sort of shine in the pile? So I, I'll kind of uh, repeat, repeat my previous answers here, but uh, uh, I think if, you, if you're really good at what you do, uh, you know, uh, trying to find your differentiation, uh, define your differentiation, your uniqueness is, is quite easier. Um, so it all starts with the reason you're doing what, what you're doing. Uh, mm -hmm. but, in, but in general, I can, I can talk about myself. I think that uh, what sets me apart is the fact that I didn't just came up with, uh, with recommendations and, you know, update this or update that, uh, and, and you're exposed here and there. Uh, I was really focused on showing you how your business is going to uh, uh, maybe even even shut down if you if you don't if you don't do this and that. Uh, mm -hmm. So I literally wired money between bank accounts for for my clients to show them how these exploits can be leveraged. Wow. Um, so you you already mentioned before, but I'll I'll bring it up again. Um, you know, you said that obviously experiences and self teaching is is preferable. But what are your thoughts on education and and cert training, uh, you know, are there any certs that you consider worthwhile these days, or any particular angles of that sort of thing that you think uh, are worth mentioning? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is a room for for these. I think that uh, there are people who want to know more. They want to sharpen their skills, and uh, as as long as you look at these certifications as a way to help you sharpen your skills and not uh, right. build a career, um, I, I think there is a room for them. Uh, in, in my company, we do provide some people with, with these certifications, so I definitely believe in that. Uh, but again, it's about how you view them, and, 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 and I view them as a way to help you get more and, and again, get more skills. Right. Yeah, they're more of a tool than a collector's item. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, tell me a bit about uh, Niotron, Neotron, is it? Yeah, Neutron is the right way to. <laughs> okay, so uh, tell me about uh, what Neutron does for its clients, and 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 I'm very curious about this. What you called a threat agnostic approach to protecting laptops, desktops, and servers, uh, the paranoid system. How does that work? So basically, we're kind of doing the complete opposite of most uh, endpoint security companies. Our focus is, uh, as you mentioned, to protect the endpoints, which is desktops and servers. Mm -hmm. um, but as I mentioned, we are. I'm not just doing it in a different way, we're actually doing the opposite of uh, most security uh, solutions out there. And by saying the opposite, I don't mean that we infect your machine rather mm -hmm. than uh, protecting it, obviously. Right. Uh, but, but the approach is very different. So while the entire industry for more than 30 years is focused on trying to enumerate all badness in the world, um, we are basically realized that bad is infinite and good is finite. So okay. that's, our, that's our biggest differentiation. We, realize that you can actually map all the finite good in the operating system. So <laughs> it might be the way you delete files, the way you create files, the way you create communications. All these um, activities that might be dangerous, we literally mapped all the right ways to do these things. Hmm. I, 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 could you sort of uh, explain that further? So you're saying basically that Paranoid looks at the way the, the individual person is doing their day-to-day -day work and sort of maps it and says that if something sort of falls outside of the acceptable range, then it means that something's going on? Even powerful than this, we say that there is no difference between you and me. The way the operating system work is actually finite. So we've mapped all the right ways to delete files, for example, at the OS level, which is the same for you and for me. I see. Um, and, uh, and we do it by analyzing every system call uh, in real time at the kernel level. Hmm. Um, so, uh, how would Paranoid protect against, for example, a, a BEC attack via a compromised email? So, uh, we analyze, again, every, every system call uh, mm -hmm. and everything re results in a system call sent to the operating system kernel, be it the email client or, um, or, or the browser or anything else. Um, and basically, we look at, at the order of system calls. Uh, so, if you compare the final system call sent by a malware or a legitimate application, it will be the same. But the path of system call sent uh, from the email client will actually be different if it's done legitimately. So that's why we analyze it. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, uh, so I noticed uh, SC Magazine gave Paranoid five stars, but noted that, uh, that it was mostly 
sort of used for very sort of high level enterprises with large budgets. Are there specific security issues that these high level organizations are requiring that only Paranoid can provide? I think we were really helpful uh, in terms of, um, um, you know, EDR or application whitelisting or application control solutions. We can actually replace some of them. Mm -hmm. um, the way I look at Paranoid is a next level EDR. So uh, mm. we call it EPR uh, because D stands for detection. Our um, main advantage is prevention. Prevention. So, yeah. uh, so basically, we do provide you a, a full blown EDR solution that, that can at the same time stop threats and not just you know, overwhelm you with data. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, so from your vantage point, what are going to be the big security issues and threats in 2020 and beyond that aren't being properly addressed right now? I think that uh, uh, if you look at, uh, at the last year, you know, with Spectre and Meltdown, I would expect that uh, something big will happen again and again. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that, uh, we are really good still with all these new technologies. Um, uh, not, not paranoid, of course, because our focus is really detecting the unknown, but I don't think enough companies are really doing that. Uh, so I think that big things such as Spectre and Meltdown will keep happening. Hmm, okay. Uh, to wrap things up today here, if you had one piece of advice for young people who are considering cybersecurity as a career or course of study, what would it be? And what are some pitfalls to avoid and some opportunities we sought out? So I think, again, uh, being focused, uh, understand what you're really good at, what you really like, which will usually be the same. Um, and don't be a sheeple. Don't just do things because, you know, uh, it seems to be lucrative. Uh, that's, that's really the single most advice that I will give people uh, rather than what certification to take or not. Um, I think that it all starts with uh, why you do something and, uh, and not, you know, uh, just follow the, the herd. Right. Chase the passion and not the money. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Near guys, thank you once again for sh sharing your fascinating story with us today. Re really appreciate it. I appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank you all for listening and watching. If you enjoyed today's video, you can find many more on our YouTube page. Just go to YouTube and type in CyberWork with InfoSec to check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. If you'd rather have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts, including this one. Just search CyberWork with InfoSec in your favorite podcast catcher. To see the current promotional offers available to listeners of this podcast, go to infosecinstitute.com slash podcast or check the link in the description. Uh, once again, use our free security, uh, our free election security training resources as well to educate poll workers and volunteers on the cybersecurity threats that they'll face during the upcoming election season. For more information about how to download your trading packet, uh, please visit infosecinstitute.com forward slash IQ forward slash election hyphen security hyphen training uh, or click the link in the description. Thanks once again to Nier Geist and thank you all for watching and listening. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs>